So, Mr. James Khan, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here with us. Delighted to be here in Dubai. What an amazing city. Have you had a good time since you arrived? I think it's only about a week that you've been here. Uh, no, I've been here literally less than a week and I've met so many amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, we had an incredible event at LinkedIn and we had another event here at SLS. And I think within two or three days, you know, having the opportunity of meeting over a hundred people, it's quite amazing. Indeed. And it just feels right. You know, mm -hmm. this is such an entrepreneurial city. The dynamism, the culture, there is that, you know, I want to succeed. I want to win culture. And for recruitment entrepreneur, the business we are launching, the fit is just incredible. Indeed. Uh, well, uh, again, thank you for joining us for this uh, Creative Zone webinar. It's called Game Changers. And you need no introduction. I mean, uh, your, your, your journey speaks for itself. Just to recap things for, for the purpose of this uh, webinar, born in Pakistan, raised in the UK, left home at the age of 16 and never looked back. Uh, you went on to establish Alexander Mann that was eventually sold for $1.1 billion. Uh, you set up your own private equity investment firm, Hamilton Broadshaw, Broadshaw Group. I mean, tell us a little bit about this journey, this, this, this day that you were leaving home at the age of 16 and sort of how did everything unfold? Um, I think I, I knew from a very early age, uh, probably if I look back, probably at the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I wanted to control my own destiny. I had no motivation of getting a job and working in a bank or whatever. My father had his own business. He had a manufacturing business that manufactured leather garments. And running a factory was just not something that remotely interested me. And in an Asian family, it is very natural that the son joins the family business. And I knew if I stayed at home, my dad would just push me into the family business. So as soon as I got to the age of 16 and I could leave school, I said to my dad, I want to go and do my own thing. My dad thought, you know, this is a spoiled child. You know, he has no money. What is he going to do? You know, he'll go stay at a friend and two days, you know, he'll run out of money and come home. Uh, but I was so determined to show him that I could make it on my own. I left at 16 uh, to go out and, and effectively, you know, find myself and, and what I wanted to do. I stumbled into recruitment like many people do. It's never a career choice, but it just, I loved it. It just suited me uh, and I loved that industry. And like most people, I then decided, actually, I think I can do this myself. Mm. And, you know, sat at my kitchen table and thought, if I set up a recruitment business, what would I call it? And I came up with the name Alexander Mann mm. and, you know, started my business. When I started, we had this tiny broom cupboard you know, where when you open the door, it hit the desk, uh, no windows. And there was me, the yellow pages and the phone. Mm. And just like anybody starting out, it was smile and dial. You know, every day you make 40 calls a day, you get out there and you pitch and you identified customers. And if you'd met me at the time and you said, James, define success, what do you want to achieve? Mm. And I would have said to you, it, it, if I did well and I could get an office with a window, then I've made it. <laughs> if you'd spoken to me three months later and said, how's it going? I would have said, I have an office with a window. But for me, success is if I could find one person that I could recruit because I feel lonely on my own. I have nobody to talk to. You know, I come into the office. So what I'm saying is success for me was taking little baby steps, mm. you know, never thinking I'm going to rule the world. It's going to be a huge business, but, you know, get an office with a window, find one person, mm. then one to five, five to 10. Mm. When I was at 10, I wasn't thinking a hundred. Mm. I was thinking, God, how amazing would it be if I had 20? Mm. When I got to a hundred, it was, imagine if I could have 500, then a thousand. Right. So the business grew to what it is today. Alexander Mann is the world's most successful talent solutions company in the world. Wow. Uh, revenues in excess of a billion dollars, employs over seven and a half thousand people, um, operates out of 25 countries, um, you know, was recently sold for over a billion dollars. 
um, and and what a journey, you know, yeah. to create something that today, you know, anywhere in the world you go, Alexander yeah. Mann is a highly respected brand. Um, so for me, without a question of doubt, something I'm incredibly proud of mm. uh, to have, you know, come up with the idea, come up with the name. Um, when I got the business, you know, to that size, we were approached by a private equity firm in America uh, who was super excited to buy the company. I was only 42. Um, and to be given an opportunity to, to sell the business and to create so much value and never have to work again. I mean, that happens in your 60s, rarely in your 40s. Right. And the opportunity for me to recreate and reinvent myself, do something completely different, was just, it was just too exciting. Mm. And so I sold the business to Advent International. Advent acquired the firm. And because I left school at 16, I had always looked back on my life and thought, if I had my time again, what would I do differently? And there was only one thing. I kind of wished I'd finished my education. Mm. And so when I sold the company for the first time in my adult life, I had something I'd never had before, which was time. Right. So I thought maybe I should just go back to school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to Harvard Business School. I did the AMP program, uh, the Advanced Management Program at Harvard. And, and obviously, once you've done your degree, we all need to take a gap year. Mm -hmm. So I took a year out mm -hmm. and I traveled. And when I was traveling, it inspired me uh, to set up the James Khan Foundation. And one of the things that as a successful entrepreneur, I always wanted to do was have the opportunity of giving back mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, impacting the lives of those who are less fortunate. Mm -hmm. And maybe it came from my background. I came from Pakistan mm -hmm. and, you know, we arrived in the UK in 1962 and, you know, with kind of very little money. And my father, you know, had a very humble beginning. And here was I in an opportunity where I could give something back. And I remember going back to Pakistan and I went to the village where my father was born and, you know, I'd never finished my education and my father had never actually been to school. Yeah. He started work from the age of eight where his mother put him in a factory, you know, to learn tailoring. Mm. And I remember in my gap year going to that village and seeing 11 o'clock in the morning, all these kids running around and thinking, why are they not at school? And realizing they're not at school because there is no school. Right. And that kind of inspired me to build um, a school dedicated in my father's name mm. to provide something that he never had, mm. which is to provide education to all of the children in that village. Um, it took us two years to build a school, but not just any school, but a school that I would send my child to. Mm. I didn't want to just build something in a village because it was a village. You know, it was a, an amazing building, great campus, you know, library, technology, English speaking. You know, we had minibuses that went and picked up the kids from the villages in the morning, brought the teachers in from the town centers. And the school today has been going for nearly 20 years. Wow. And we educate 686 children. Mm. And we have a two year waiting list because the school is free. We charge nothing to the children. And literally over that 20 year period, we have changed the dynamics of that village because if you'd gone there 20 years ago, that child, you know, effectively worked on a farm. Mm. His father worked on the farm and his grandfather worked on the farm. So they've been in this kind of cycle for generations. But today we are educating children who are becoming doctors, you know, teachers and actually we are changing the dynamics of that village and, mm. and actually for me it's been one of the most amazing things mm. to have done because I've used my entrepreneurial experience and ability but in a slightly different way mm. and one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is actually you get way more by giving than you do receiving absolutely that that sense of satisfaction that mm. achievement when you can impact the life of somebody who's less privileged than yourself mm. so selling alexander man actually gave me that opportunity to do that mm. otherwise the idea would never have come to me mm. having finished my gap year i then had to start something or, or, or do something because 
how much golf can you really play? <laughs> um, so I created a private equity firm because when I was at Harvard, you know, in, in the early 2000s, private equity was the biggest buzzword. Everybody wanted to be in private equity. Mm. And I thought maybe I could reinvent myself from recruitment to private equity, but I still kept my roots in recruitment mm. and effectively set up Hamilton Bradshaw to invest in other recruitment businesses and also to, to support entrepreneurs who wanted to build their own business. Right. Because I felt my experience at Alexander Mann of building, but most importantly, scaling a business to mm. size and to growth mm. was, was an experience that was quite valuable. Mm. And so many entrepreneurs get stuck at that. Mm. So I thought Hamilton Bradshaw could facilitate entrepreneurs who wanted to scale their business, build mm. a brand, build mm. a legacy, so we could really invest in those kind of businesses, yeah. which is really what Hamilton Bradshaw did. And we invested in probably over 20 businesses, all in the recruitment industry, and mm -hmm. became very well known around the world as the investor of choice you know, for human capital. Mm. On the back of Hamilton Bradshaw, I got the opportunity uh, to do a TV show mm on the BBC called Dragon's Den, mm. which was an amazing experience. Did that for five years. Uh, and on the back of the success of Dragon's Den, uh, I was approached by the British government who wanted to, to create Britain to become a much more entrepreneurial society. Mm. The government realized that in the Western world today, we're just not creating enough jobs. Mm. We've got people you know, graduating, coming into the workplace. There just isn't the jobs available. So they believe that by starting a business, by default, you create a job. Mm. And they wanted to create an organization to stimulate entrepreneurship. And they were mm. looking for somebody to run that organization as a kind of a, a visionary that had that entrepreneurial background. Um, so I got appointed as founder chairman of Startup Loans. Mm. My target from the government was a three-year project to create a thousand businesses mm. in the UK economy. They gave me one billion pounds to effectively invest in businesses. During my three year period, uh, we ended up creating 28,000 businesses, wow. creating 105,000 jobs. Um, and when I stepped down as founder chairman, I was invited to Buckingham Palace and awarded the CBE, Commander of the British Empire, uh, which was an amazing accolade and just the most incredible experience, you know, the, the kind of pageantry of the United Kingdom in the palace and when you walk in and you kneel and, you know, you bow your head and, and they give you the CBE. I mean, it was just amazing, amazing experience. And when I look back, um, just a fantastic recognition. Um, I then went back into Hamilton Bradshaw and decided to launch a business called Recruitment Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And Recruitment Entrepreneur was really founded on the back of the success that I'd had with Hamilton Bradshaw. And literally every week, because I have such a, a huge following on LinkedIn, mm. I think today I'm probably the most followed person in the world mm. on LinkedIn in recruitment. I have three and a half million followers. And every month I have somebody from Japan, America, Canada, Australia writing to me saying, James, I want to get into recruitment. I want to start a recruitment business. Can you back me? And on the back of that, we've decided to create this global brand called Recruitment Entrepreneur. We're going to be all over the world in 20 countries. And we are going to effectively be investing in entrepreneurs who either have a recruitment business, want to get into a recruitment business, or want to exit a business. And Recruitment Entrepreneur not only provides capital mm. investment, but most importantly, it provides the expertise that I learned on how to scale Alexander Mann. Mm. So we coach, we mentor founders, we provide the entire suite of services from operations, back office, finance, technology, HR, marketing, branding, customer acquisition, talent attraction, we have a group of nearly 50 people around the world that are true experts at what they do. Mm. And effectively, they work with founders as a resource to help coach and develop them to scale their business. Mm. Already, in a relatively short period of time, 
we've managed to to kind of invest, coach, mentor, scale 14 businesses that already have exited. So because of my private equity firm, Hamilton Bradshaw, as these businesses evolve and as they grow, we have the natural partner that identifies the potential buyer that allows the founders to realize real wealth in what they've created. And this is the reason why you are in Dubai this week. You've come to sort of set the, 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 the founding stone of what is recruitment uh, entrepreneur Middle East. Absolutely. What's a little bit the, the story behind uh, this new uh, office? So opening? we've been tracking this region for the last year. Our conclusion is Dubai is the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. The buzz, the excitement, the entrepreneurial spirit in this region is second to none. Everybody comes here for a reason. They come to work and they come to achieve something. So you have that natural DNA, that, that passion, that drive of people who want to succeed and do well. The people we have met in, in the Middle East, I think, have been remarkable. But if you go back, you know, 50 years, this, is a, this was a trading community. Mm. You know, the Middle Eastern culture is very much about traders. Mm. You then have a lot of expats coming here, but they come here to work. Mm. You know, and people, when they arrive here, it's such a thriving city. And they are doing business from here to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, to Bahrain, to Egypt, etc. So we see Dubai as the hub for this region. And for recruitment entrepreneur to have a base here, I think this will become one of the biggest regions that we will have globally. Because just my initial impression of people I've met, you know, everybody wants to do well. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. They want to build businesses. So the platform for recruitment entrepreneur, I think, will be amazing here. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we, we wrote an article last week on the media where we were reflecting on how Dubai is looking to double its population by 2040. That gives evidence of the potential that, that there is here for an industry such as recruitment. It shows that the number of companies that are coming to set up here. Uh, has these been some of the elements that you have analyzed when deciding to come to the UAE? I mean, so we looked at the economy, we looked at the GDP, we looked at the growth, we looked at the sectors that were doing well, we looked at the type of people who are coming here, we looked at the kind of growth rate that the countries achieve. But also, when you look at this region, Dubai attracts some of the most the best talent in the region. You know, when COVID hit, mm. you know, s thousands of people relocated to Dubai. Yeah. You know, Dubai has benefited, you know, over the last 10 years. But the thing that we look for, the thing that is most important to us, is which country is attracting talent. Mm. We are in the business of talent. Yeah. And Dubai, in my opinion, attracts some of the best talent in the region. Mm. You know, more people come here because it offers so much mm. you know and and dubai works yeah. it's easy you can move you can set up a home set up a business you can open a bank account it has amazing restaurants amazing lifestyle it's fantastic for children it has great education mm. so from our perspective we want to be where the talent is mm. because our clients attract talent mm. so that's where you need to be so i see this you know as a 10 to 20 year play mm. And I'm confident without any reservation, any doubt, mm. that we will back some incredible people here. Mm -hmm. During your time... Yeah. So it's kind of cool because yeah. you can have an apartment and your office is here, you have meetings here. Indeed. So actually you end up never leaving the place. Absolutely. Very good. And that's a little bit... Uh, we use this a little bit in the media and the story on how Dubai has grown so much. I think in the past people used to live in three distinct places. You used to have your home, your office, and another place that you go on holiday. Now you have everything in one place. Yeah. You live, you work, and you go on holiday in the same place. Yeah, because you go upstairs yeah. to the pool, yeah. downstairs to the office, <laughs> exactly. and in the middle you have your offices. Yeah, and you live here. And actually, I must admit, they have done a very good, the inside is quite quirky, yeah, right? Yeah. They've spent a lot of money on the fit out here. We have a bit of a view, maybe we can go here, let's have a look. I love the pond. And yeah, I looked. It's easier to for me to rent. It's the same market, the same 
I, I also looked at Wonder Palm there. Ah, that's a good project. Yeah, I really liked that building. I thought the flats were beautiful. Yeah. As, as one of the dragons on, on the dragon's den, uh, I, I, I've read and, and I've seen a lot of the sort of the highlights uh, of, of your journey there. What would you say are some of the things that uh, st strike you the most of, of, of your experience there? What are some of the highlights? What have you learned, if I could say, from the people that came onto the show, that they were pitching uh, their startups, their projects? I think, I mean, I was very fortunate that in my five years on the show, I met over a thousand entrepreneurs and, you know, as you've seen from the show, some crazy ideas, some amazing ideas and some ridiculous ideas, yeah. but that's business. Not everybody's going to be successful. I think probably for me, the thing that I learned is people sometimes spend way more time thinking about the idea than thinking about the viability of the idea. Yeah. So I remember somebody coming in and pitching me an idea where they wanted to set up uh, a new magazine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'd spent two years researching it, developing the idea, developing the concept, developing the content. And, you know, when I, when I listened to the pitch, I thought it was great. And I said, what price point are you looking to, to position this magazine? And they said, you know, $10. Okay. Nobody spends ten dollars on a magazine. Yeah. So actually, rather than spending all that time on the idea, if yeah. you'd spent a little bit more time on the market you were going to service, yeah, you could have got to that answer very quickly. So at the end of two years, they never even launched because they got one thing wrong. Yeah. So I think to me, when I look at an entrepreneur, of course I want it to be a good idea. But I think there are three fundamental drivers. You need a good idea, but that's not 100%. It's yeah. only 30%. Knowing your market and who you're going to deliver that product to is as important. And what price point are you going to position your product or service? Because everything sells at a price, mm. whatever you do whether you're on media, whether you're on recruitment, whether you're in legal finance, everything is price sensitive. So if you position your pricing incorrectly, it doesn't even take off right. or you never make money yeah. because you've just got the pricing wrong. I don't think entrepreneurs spend enough time. Secondly, if you don't understand your market, what is it about your product or service that the market wants to buy and why would they want to buy yours? Mm. What is your key differential? 80% mm. of the businesses I saw in the den look like 10 other business mm. that were already out there yeah. that actually are well established. Yeah. So if you come into that market with an established group of businesses that are already doing well, why does the customer switch to you? Mm, mm. If there is no differential, mm. you will struggle. Mm. So I think the, the key thing that I learned is, yes, you need a good idea, but you've got to think it through. Right. Because otherwise, business is tough. Mm. There are obviously way more businesses that don't make it yeah. than there are businesses that do make it. Indeed. And, and I believe that the, 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 the issue of scaling up becomes that sort of a, a step in which a lot of the startups and entrepreneurs don't manage to go through that next phase of things. Us as a company at Creative Zone, we see a lot of one to three employee type of businesses, but a lot of people struggle in, in going to that next phase of things, in the scaling up of the business. What would be some of your tips for the purpose of the viewers of this show on, on, on if you want to scale up a business, these are the three or four things that you should be looking into? I mean, it's a great question, and I think it's the one thing that I experienced the most. You know, so on this particular trip, you know, I came from Singapore uh, and then prior to that, I was in Australia. Then I'm going to sh Hong Kong, Shanghai, Tokyo, uh, Toronto, New York, Madrid, Germany. So I'm literally traveling the world um, through Recruitment Entrepreneur. And what I see in every city is exactly what you describe, that entrepreneurs get the business to a certain size and mm. typically three to five people mm. and very quickly it becomes a lifestyle business they just can't scale yeah. and i think what recruitment entrepreneur is becoming so well known around the world 
is the one true partner that can help you scale that business to create intrinsic value. What we find is most people who set up their business, they typically were the big billers in what they did before. Indeed. So maybe he was a lawyer, he was a great biller, and he yeah. generated lots of fees. He was in media and advertising, you know, he generated lots of clients and revenues. He's in recruitment, he's a great biller. So typically, it's the billers who start. Yeah. But what we have learned is just because you can bill does not necessarily mean you can build an organization, you can build a brand, you can attract talent, you can build the back office, the finance, the corporate governance, you have the right customer acquisition strategy, you have the right leadership and development program in your business, you have the right career structure, you have the right mm. L&D program. Mm. Without some of those components, it is just a boutique. And what we find is you just don't know what you don't know. Mm. Because in your entire background and professional career, you were effectively a revenue generator. Mm. And the components that you need to build and scale a business are very different. Mm. And revenue is just one of those components. Mm. So in our model, to scale a business, there are 10 components that we work on and build. The founders that we typically meet have one. So it is not possible to scale a business when you, know, when you can only do one of 10 things. Right. So what we tend to do to scale that business is put all of that infrastructure to develop, design, and implement a talent attraction strategy so that you as a business to scale have a clear strategy on how you attract people, mm. what you pay them, how you attract them, where you get them from, how you manage them. Yeah. We then implement a very clearly defined leadership and development program so the people that you hire have a proper career path. Right. We create a defined career structure. Mm. So people come in, you know, what do they do at the beginning and the middle and how do they evolve, how do they grow, mm. how do they progress in the organization. We put in good corporate governance. Mm. So if you're ever going to sell the business, you know, does the business have a regular monthly board meeting? Does it have a board pack? I have a okay. question for you. What's your favorite part of the cow? I quite like the <laughs> ribeye, actually. Yeah, me too, actually. I quite like it. It's got... Turkish guy, uh, yeah. Nusret. Nusret, yeah, with the salt. You, you and him would be a good combination of uh, <laughs> media exposure. He's got how many million followers as well or something? What is Hannah doing in Dubai? Um, she's married to, her husband runs a business in Dubai. Okay. A refrigeration business and she oh. looks after their family office. Okay, good. So kind of managing investments, real estate, property. James, with the work that you do now with the recruitment entrepreneur uh, and with this concept of you advising s startups and entrepreneurs that are getting into the business of, of recruitment, I could assume that when starting a business with the idea of an exit requires another sort of uh, mentality on the way that you're looking to develop this business. I think many of us start companies and we're not thinking of the idea from day one uh, that this is a strategy towards exiting this business. Does this mean that uh, these people that you're looking into or the ones that you catch at an early stage, you're already kind of aligning them with the idea of thinking of this uh, with the idea of an exit? I think what we absolutely believe is most entrepreneurs, when they're going through this entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey, that journey takes 10 to 15 years. And during that period, if you end up after 15 years and you've really created a lifestyle business, you've created no intrinsic value in the business itself. Mm. What we're saying is, if you do it right, if you do it professionally, if you grow the business in a particular way, you can actually create real value in the business. So not only have you built a business, you built a brand, you've, you've done extremely well, you've created a fantastic lifestyle for yourself and your family, but actually you've created wealth. And what Recruitment Entrepreneur is really about is giving the entrepreneur that opportunity of creating a legacy, a brand, a scale of a business that has an intrinsic value that you have the optionality that if you choose at any point in the future that you want to sell that business, you built it in a way that is attractive to a buyer. And what we find is, and we meet entrepreneurs all over the world who've been doing this for 10 or 15 years, 
They have a good business. It makes money. But the truth is it has no value. And I just feel it's such a lost opportunity that if they knew what they were doing, if somebody had shown them how to build it in an institutional way, today they would have created tens of millions in value. Mm -hmm. uh, from what you have described throughout this interview, there is a lot of aspects that you describe where you're explaining things that have a big sense of giving back. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, 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 on your description of things that talks about supporting, giving to people. Has this been part of uh, a big part of everything that you have done throughout your career, the concept of giving back to, to people, always finding a way of doing something good for, for the other side, if we can call it that way? Um, I think when I started out my journey, you know, my father said a couple of things to me that have just resonated in my head. And I think whenever you are arriving in a new country, like so many people in Dubai, you know, you're an immigrant, really, and you have to work twice as hard. And therefore, I think you have to create that balance of a win-win situation And I think too often I see in business, everybody wants to win at all cost, which means somebody has to lose. Mm. And I think if you can create a culture and environment where everybody wins, life is more fun. Mm. It's much more enjoyable. The journey of success is worth going for. And you make a lot of friends along the way. Mm. Whereas I find if you're not giving back, you become very transactional. Mm. Everything is the next deal, the next deal, the next deal. And if I'm honest, it's a bit of a lonely life. Mm. And I found throughout my journey that I actually want to be successful. I want to make money, but I want to enjoy life too. Mm. You know, I want to work with people I love. I want to have clients that I respect. Mm. I want to have partners that I enjoy spending an evening with. And therefore, you create an environment where you're constantly looking for that balance mm. where, you know, in every country around the world, I have a partner, right. you know, and, and our entire model is about share ownership. Mm. We don't want to own all of it. Mm. It's, it's not about the percentage you own. It's what it's worth. Mm. What I find entrepreneurs, they have this obsession is I need to own it all. But, you know, one of the things that my father said was 100% of nothing is still nothing. Mm. So I'd rather own, you know, 20%, 30% of something that has substantial value mm. than have the ego of owning 100% of nothing. Mm. And when I look around the world, I mean, most people, they got four people, you know, the business has no value, but they own 100% of it. Mm. Whereas I don't own 100% of any business and I've never owned 100% because actually you can't build scale mm. and retain people, retain the best people if people are not aligned with your ambition and your success. And therefore the concept of shared ownership is the fundamental principles of what I believe in. Mm. What would you say have been some of the most influential people along this journey of yours? Um, I think the one person that probably does stick out for me, you know, was probably my father. And I just think his humble beginnings, his work ethic, his determination, his desire, his drive to create balance, his belief in that win-win formula... I think have been instilled in me and have never left me, you know, and I think anything, whether you're a parent or whether you're, you know, building a business, you need to instill or have values and principles that you live by. Mm. And, and I think that has shaped me to the entrepreneur I am today. Mm. Is there one thing that you feel has been the main contributor of, of your success? Is there one thing that really catapulted you to, to, you know, going to the next side of things? I think if I had to think of one thing, it would be that to create and build a scalable business, to create a brand, to create a legacy, to create a world-class organization can never be done with one person. Mm. And it is a collection of people. Mm. It is about a team. 
to find a team to attract the best people to retain those people to take people on that journey with you without recognizing their value without sharing in your success it's very difficult to do yeah and if there's one thing that's enabled me to do that so you know if you look at my private equity firm you know my team has been together with me for over 20 years wow um you know and like anyone they get approached all the time they could have left 20 times yeah why are they still there mm. you know everybody who is working with me in every business i have they've all been there 5 years 10 years 15 years 20 years etc and the reason i think they stay is because we are aligned when i do well they do well with me mm. and that concept of shared ownership i think has been the fundamental principle around the success that i've enjoyed is there anything that you would have liked to have done differently when you look back at things not really i'm a great believer in have no regrets i'm a great believer that anything that has happened throughout my career that didn't do well or went wrong was the things that i learned the most from and life is a journey and if you don't learn you don't progress mm. and you know even things when i look back and i think oh my god that didn't work out well or that you know i could have done it differently but the fact that it didn't work out mm. meant that i had the opportunity to learn from that mm. and get better mm. so i don't look at failure as a negative i look at failure as part of the journey of success mm. anyone that you meet today who is successful has made mistakes there is no such thing as the perfect entrepreneur mm. so i think you know for me i never look back because mm. i can do nothing about it i can't change the past mm. but i can shape the future mm. so i look back and learn from what i've done wrong mm. and say how does that enable me to be better at what i'm doing excellent well i'm reaching the end of of today's session um, maybe as a wrap up What would be your final message for thousands of entrepreneurs looking at this uh, video podcast? What would you tell them on on you know this journey that they're going through? Uh, a key, a few key tips that you could give them on you know how to uh, eventually become successful the way that you have done. Um, so I, th I suppose if we were encapsulating, you know, so what are the takeaway messages? I think when you're in a new market like we are arriving in Dubai. You know, the first thing that that I would think of is observe the masses and do the opposite. Just by following everybody else does not mean it's successful. When you're going on this journey, you will make mistakes. It's inevitable, and therefore, just understand that failure is part of the journey of success. It's not failure in itself. It is a step closer to where you want to be. I think recognizing that. To be successful is never about you. Mm. When we run people-based businesses, it's having the ability to build and attract a team, and in that team, create that common sense of shared ownership. Mm. You know, be prepared to share in the success of what you're doing, and give people a reason to want to be with you and want to come along that journey. That, for me, has been absolute paramount. I think look at business from the point of view that to be successful is not about transactions it's about relationships. Transactions are very short-lived, relationships last forever. And therefore whether you hire somebody, whether you have a client, focus on building that relationship because it gives the business much more longevity in terms of the future. And they would be some of the things that I you know fundamentally live by and i thought i suppose on closing that you know if you are able to give a little bit back it mm. doesn't have to be a huge amount but i find you get way more from giving than you do receiving indeed james gunn thank you so much absolute pleasure thank you